Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 2 p.m. lecture by Glenn Ryan. That's me. How do you do? Nice to meet you. And what can I say? Um, I'm a biochemist by training, and I um, gave up biochemistry and all its exciting implications for plant growth and human health, and, get, and now pursue a career in energy medicine, because I think energy is where it's all at. And that's what I've been talking to you guys for the last several years about at this conference, about the energetic role and nature of uh, healing the plants and growing plants. However, this time I'm going to talk a little bit more focused about not energy in general, but about this model, which has apparently been given by Dan many times. And all of you guys have taken Dan's workshops, I'm sure, and are aware of his um, theory. And uh, Dan is very elegant in his... Um, the model is complicated, and apparently nobody's even adventured to try to explain it, and let alone give a scientific rationale and justification for this model. But I'm going to be the first to try to do that. So um, I appreciate your coming and your support, because... This is history in the making, you guys. So this is the first time this is going to be presented formally uh, in any kind of organized way. Well, that's what it's all about. Organization. Coherence is the magic word. Coherence in the food is what Dan would always talk about. And actually, three years ago, I think, I, I spoke at this conference about that in the, in the context of vitality, because to me, you know, by, Dan talks a lot about the vitality of a, of a food product in terms of its chemistry and its completeness and the, the, the good guys and the lack of the bad guys, like toxins. But to me, healthy food is all about vitality. And to me, that means energy. So we're going to talk about energy. Of course, Dan uses the word coherence, which is fine. It's just a characteristic of energy. So I'm going to kind of go into that in a little more detail, but just so we all are on the same page, we're going to start with the model. And the model basically says that you've got two inputs into the body, either food, which you guys all know about, and that part's pretty obvious and straightforward, but that the food, if the food is coherent, it creates coherence in the body, particularly in certain biomolecules, like the one right in the center of the spine there, which looks like a DNA. And why did I put a DNA there? Because DNA, I believe, acts as an antenna to receive the kind of information either from the food, the quantum coherent information from the food, or from universal consciousness. Now, if you're religious, you could use the word divine or spiritual. If you're a hardcore scientist, unlike me, I'm a little bit of both. I'm a Gemini. I can get away with it. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I can, on my left brain, go, yes, let's talk about higher dimensional reality. And then my right brain, am I going, oh, or my heart, I'm talking about divine energy. In any case, whatever you want to call it, it's, the, I'm calling it universal consciousness, so people don't get turned off if you're a religious. Uh, and you've got these two inputs, and in both cases, what you end up doing is making your antenna more effective at receiving the energy that you're getting from the food and from the universe and broadcasting that energy back out on the right side as coherent energy. So if you're getting, putting coherent food into your body, you're, you're generating coherent energy. Coherent energy then in turn feeds back onto the body, which I didn't quite show, uh, as coherent vibrations. And I mean, that's a non-technical word, but it, oscillation is a scientific term, but you know what I mean. And that coherent energy then has two functions. It either promotes healing or it uh, raises your consciousness. And I talk about both, actually, usually on the far right. So this model of Dan's model is fine with me. You know, it makes sense to me. I just have a slightly different perspective when I lecture, so... <laughs> I'm going to talk about energy in general and coherence in specific. And in specific, specific, you know, where, where the energy comes from, in the soil at least, because it can come from the soil, come from the water, it come from the air, it come from the universe. 
uh, is from rare earth elements because, I mean, they have some rather unique properties that we'll get into later. Okay, having said all that, here's the outline. Uh, so if you want to walk away, you can watch this slide and then walk away because then you get the gist of the whole thing, right? Ooh. So we got to start out with, with energy because in order to understand coherence, you have to understand energy. So let's, we're going to talk about energy surrounding cells and molecules and how it heals. Then I'll offer a definition of coherence. And then I'm going to give examples of coherence in the body, particularly the heart, because I used to work at HeartMath, the Institute of HeartMath, where we studied the heart. That was, oh, by way of introduction, I left academia. I left Stanford University to join the Institute of HeartMath. And I thought that was so cool. They were studying love. And they're like, oh, God, this is awesome, man. You know? uh, and positive emotions and coherence in the heart. And I thought, wow. Science I was doing at Stanford sucks compared to that. So I left Stanford and never went back. Anyway, so there, we're going to talk about the heart and coherence in molecules and coherence in water and coherence uh, in rare earth elements. And eventually, we'll get to coherence in, in the food we eat, if you could stick it out that long and if I make it that long. Probably no break, because I've got a lot of material to cover. But you can hang in there, hopefully. That's the introduction. So now that we've got the overview, let's focus on energy and what energy is. Now, of course, energy traditionally is in physics uh, is associated with matter, matter and energy. Remember E equals MC squared, that famous guy who apparently looks like me or I look like him, whichever one came first, he came first, right? <laughs> uh, but not by much, <laughs> I'm older than I look. Uh, so the relationship between energy and matter is, is critical because in traditional physics and traditional science, energy comes from chemistry. The chemistry is the source of the energy field that is radiated from a molecule or a chemical or a star or the earth or whatever. But lately, they decided, well, maybe that's not quite right because quantum physics comes along and says, yeah, but, but quantum energy is fundamental or even more fundamental than that is consciousness. And that is the source of everything. And the matter then uh, arises from that rather than energy and consciousness arising from matter. So they're kind of flipping the whole field upside down. And it's creating havoc, to be quite honest, because everyone's, you know, everyone's very confused about quantum physics anyway because it doesn't really make any sense. But what I just said makes a lot of sense to me. But that's because of my spiritual teachings and trainings or whatever. And also because I do what other people don't do. I mean, I'm in this very esoteric field of energy medicine, of which there are very few people that do what I do. Beverly Rubick and Jim Oshman are two of my colleagues, and they just spoke at this conference. And i honored to be here to share some of my insights, whatever. I've been doing this for like 40 years, so i got, got to say something. Uh, anyway, so, so we're, I'm working on this model here, that consciousness is fundamental, and then from that, we, uh, we go into the quantum domain and, we talk, and quantum fields, energy fields are generated, which then in turn generate electromagnetic fields, which the body can use. The body doesn't understand quantum fields and, and consciousness in the sense that the body is pretty stupid, sorry, but it, it doesn't really understand how to resonate with or be influenced by higher dimensional energies of which these two on the left are. I mean, we live in a four dimensional reality of space and time, right? Three space and one time. And these energies that we're talking about here are higher dimensional. So one of my missions, apparently, in this lifetime is to figure out how the body can convert higher dimensional energy into ordinary four-dimensional electromagnetic energy, which the body can relate to. It, there's a lot of science showing that electromagnetic fields in the body regulate the biochemical processes. So right after EM over there, electromagnetic, we're going to add one more arrow, and that's the body, because the electromagnetic fields control the body and body functions and biochemicals. The body is electrochemical. 
But the pharmaceutical industry and the whole medical industry and even the scientific community are obsessed with the chemical side of the equation. And it's the, uh, they're just missing out on the whole electrical part. So I put all of these energies into the electrical part. And uh, it's, the same thing applies and is relevant for you guys because you, although you guys focus on the chemicals in the soil and the chemicals in the food, uh, Dan is very conscious and aware of these other things, the energetic side on the, on the left side, which is what I'm here to talk about. Okay, so energy. What is energy? Well, there are lots of different kinds of energies. And first we have to make the distinction between classical energy and energy which doesn't obey the laws of Maxwell. Um, here I'm talking about electromagnetics, but the same thing applies to sound energy. Oh, here we have a list right here. We have all the different kinds of energy. Sound, acoustic energy, that's another word for sound. Healing with sound, we all know that, right? Third bullet down is electromagnetic. But then we have plasma energy, which is the latest greatest. And then we have photon, or light energy. And then we have quantum energy, and we have consciousness itself. Now, I've done a lot of work with actually all of these except light. Haven't gotten around to that yet. But they all have two aspects, the classical and the non-classical. Classical electromagnetic fields, for example, are the kind that Maxwell discovered the equations to describe their behavior. But unfortunately, that, those equations don't apply to all electromagnetic fields. They've now pretty well established that there are other kinds of electromagnetic fields and all these other energies that don't obey the standard equations in physics. So I call them non-classical. Sometimes they're called non-Maxwellian. Sometimes they're called non-Hertzian. I have a whole slide of the, the different words, and they're all non, because <laughs> they don't know what it is. So they, they, tell, you, they tell you what it's not. That's, you know, that's the way scientists think, I guess. But, but they do have other names, like a spin field is a, is a field that's generated not from an electron moving like that, but from an electron moving like that. And that has a very unusual set of properties. They're obsessed with that, uh, those kind of fields in Russia. They call them torsion fields. And they have uh, been doing a lot of work. And Amer American scientists don't even know what a torsion field is, let alone study it. So, and the, even, all non-Hertzian or non-classical electromagnetic fields, they're just not studied by the scientific community. That's where uh, I came in, because I started saying, well, I, I, so I joined, I got very excited when I was young. I, I read an article by a PhD scientist who was a nun, and she was studying the effects of healing energy on an enzyme in a test tube. And, and you know, healers come and they just go bzzz, and they put out an energy, and they affect enzymes in test tubes. I thought that was the coolest thing, because all of a sudden, you can heal the body without drugs, with just energy. And I said, okay, that's it, that's it, that's what I'm gonna do for the rest of my life. I mean, that's, that was as bad as when I was eight years old, I read a book, or nine years old, I read a book called The Boy Scientist, and that was it. I knew I wanted to be a scientist. I read that article, that's it. I knew I got to study energy. So then I discovered the Bioelectromagnetic Society, which is the scientists who study energy electromagnetic mostly, a little acoustic, uh, but mostly electromagnetic. But they only study certain kinds of electromagnetic fields. And so I'm standing there going, well, I don't want to do what everyone else is doing. So I'll study non-classical electromagnetic fields. And that's kind of how I started the whole business and did some research with scalar energy. Scalar energy is a, a kind of electromagnetic energy where you take two ordinary conventional electromagnetic fields and pose them 180 degrees and they cancel. And what is canceled is the electric and magnetic components, but there are other components, the subtle energy part of that, which are not canceled. So you get rid of the gross electric and magnetic fields and then these subtle fields that underlie in the electric and magnetic fields come to the surface. And then they behave very differently because you get rid of the, you know, the, the ball and chain kind of thing. <laughs> nice analogy. Uh, okay, so anyway, here, this is the kind of energies we're talking about. So I just should say that I'm happy to have questions at any point. 
Like other speakers don't necessarily do that. But you know, if you don't understand something, then I have failed. <gasps> and I want to make sure that you get it before we move on to the next thing. Because it's kind of linear, although my brain is very nonlinear. But I try to make it linear so you could follow it in a logical way and say, oh, OK, we're going to talk about energy. And then we're going to talk about coherence and blah, blah, blah. You saw the outline. OK, so that's the energy. So for me, the big question is, has been all along, how does this energy heal the body? And the standard explanations are down at the bottom. Electromagnetic fields affect the vibrations in the body, affect the oscillations of the chemical bonds. I mean, the, bo the body vibrates, all kinds of vibrations in the, in the body at the chemical level, at the organ level, some organ like, you know, an or like a speaker, right? That's a, 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 a thin film. Well, that oscillates, and you generate a field, a sound wave. Well, that kind of stuff happens in the body, too. So it's not only molecules and atoms that vibrate, but big organs, too. Anyway, so there are all kinds of oscillations that occur. And that's the standard explanation. But then it turns out that quantum fields and consciousness have kind of a different mechanism. I mean, all the kinds of energy ultimately affect the vibration, if you will. But these higher forms of energy that I'm talking about, if it's a quantum field, for example, well, then it affects the quantum properties of the biological system. So nowadays, quantum properties in the body are something that's a, a very cool thing to study. It, it's a new field, actually. It's called quantum biology. Imagine that. And I call myself a quantum biologist because I've been studying this kind of stuff for ages and wrote a book about it 30 years ago and called it quantum biology. And nowadays, it's, 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 it, in those days, it was kind of new agey, kind of woo-woo kind of stuff, although I try to add a little science here and there and make it respectable. But it was still pretty far out stuff. Nowadays, quantum biology is a legitimate scientific discipline. And it's well known that the body exhibits all these uh, quantum properties, like teleportation. Oh, that's fun. Everyone's heard about that, right? Or quantum tunneling, like another example. So if, if, if an electron has to go over an energy barrier, you look at like a big mountain, you know, the old-fashioned way is you've know, got to generate enough energy and climb up the mountain, and then you go down the other side. Well, that's the old-fashioned way. The quantum way is you just tunnel right through the base of the thing, and you just appear on the other side like that. So that's kind of cool, understandable analogy. So that's quantum tunneling. And that happens all over the body, as it turns out. But so there are lots of cool things. Uh, and then um, we have consciousness. Well, well, how does consciousness affect the body? <laughs> right, that's a million-dollar question. But there are people who are studying that. Uh, particularly a guy named Stuart Hameroff, University of Arizona. Um, and he's obsessed with this particular kind of substance called microtubules, which is kind of interesting. It, it, it's an oscillation of sorts, but it's, it's more like a shift from uh, in a particular protein called tubulin, which makes up microtubules. Microtubules are these things that are involved with cell division and, and cell replication and the DNA divides divides up in, in, into two things, the microtube, you know, the, the male and the female. And microtubules are integrally involved with that, but they have other functions as well. So anyway, he's been pioneering the role of microtubules in as acting as antenna for these higher kinds of energies. Because what it does, the, the protein that makes up the microtubules exists in two shapes two states, a kind of an alpha and a beta state, if you will. So they're slightly different from each other, but they both exist. And what happens is they, it oscillates back and forth between the two states. So it's constantly going back and forth between the alpha and the beta shape. So he thought that was like a really cool mechanism for receiving subtle energies. Another word that I use for all this kind of stuff is subtle energy in honor of Bill Tiller, who recently passed away, who was a professor at Stanford. I wasn't a professor at Stanford. I was a professor at Mount Sinai in New York. Oh, just, or in the East Coast, yeah. I live in California, so uh, I forget where I am here. I do a lot of traveling. So 
that's one theory. Uh, I've lectured a lot about the role of DNA in, as acting as an antenna. That's like a whole lecture. Uh, in essence, DNA has some rather unusual quantum properties that allow it to act as an antenna. And we'll talk about DNA here and there, but just giving you a big picture here about how these different kind of energies heal the body. Of course, how they raise consciousness is completely unknown because we don't even know what consciousness is, let alone how to raise it. Eh, great question. Yeah, you, well, you don't measure the energy itself uh, because all of the detectors that we have, I call them electron wiggle detectors, what they detect is moving electrons and stuff. But quantum fields don't affect uh, the movement of electrons. They affect the phase of the electrons, which is complicated, but it's not the ordinary thing that you can measure. And it's the fa measuring the phase of an electron, I don't even think you can measure the phase. Yeah, you can, but it's complicated. So mostly what you do is you measure the effect that it has on the body. And if it produces such and such an effect, like it causes you to levitate, you go, oh, okay, well, that's not normal. That must be a quantum effect or a quantum field that's producing this unusual behavior. So it's a great question, and it's, it's hard to answer that in a, in a sentence or two. <laughs> quantum physics, experimental quantum physics these days is very sophisticated. You'd be surprised what they can measure. It's just biologists don't do it. You know, so there, there's a schasm here between, between what the theoretical or experimental physicists can do and experimental biologists. Now, there are a few people trying to combine the two, that's quantum biology, but in general they don't, but yes they can, and that's how they can know that there are quantum events going on. And we're, I'm just proposing here that these quantum events can act as antenna, both receive higher dimensional energies and emit them. So if, in fact, we're talking about higher dimensional energies, let's just say that the more of that, and this is part of Dan's model, actually, too, the more of that kind of energy, or consciousness, whatever you want to call it, that gets into the body, the higher vibration your body functions at, and all the antennas that are there picking up this information, this energy, function better. So, I mean, that's, to me, that's kind of healing, but, you know, the difference between healing and raising your consciousness is kind of a fine tune here because you're raising the vibration of the, of the body, or the plant for that matter, but I guess the ultimate goal is the body. You know, it'd be nice to have our, our, uh, our broccoli talk to us and, you know, be able to communicate with us, but, you know, the focus for me anyway is on the body part so that if you bring in more of these higher dimensional energies, your body functions better, it functions more coherently, the antenna function better, and even the straight biochemical processes, the enzymes function better. So that leads to, to healing, and the distinction between healing and, and consciousness raising is something we could talk about for hours, but it's just try to bring the concepts across here. So, okay, so I should move on. Okay, so here we go. So here's some more fancy words for these alternative kinds of energies, the non-classical electromagnetic fields. The, in the scientific literature, they got a lot of very fancy names for this kind of energy other than scalar, which is a kind of a misnomer and not really the best name. But I mean, you know, like I love the term null fields because you know, there's, there's no field. There's no force field. So ordinary electromagnetic fields have a force. You, you know, they, you, you can, if you're a Qigong master, you can do that and move, it, move a person or a chair or whatever. These kind of energies don't have force. They have information. So they're often called information fields as, as a distinction. Or standing waves or other fancy names. And they don't look like ordinary electromagnetic fields. That, that's an example of a Beltrami field a guy who just did the mathematics and came up with the shape of these unusual fields. And he, that's mathematically what it comes up with. I mean, that's a fancy thing. He calls them helicoids, but we could call them screws because they kind of look like a screw. Non-technical term. Okay, okay. So now back to the question of, that you were asking. What, what, uh, how do you measure these fields? Because if, if they're not electron detectors, 
uh, able to pick them up, how do we measure them? So there are some rather unconventional ways of doing it and conventional ways that are uh, distorted a bit so they can actually pick up these kind of energies. I'm going to talk about the, the second and the third mostly. Talk a little bit about biophotons later. Okay. Uh, so here's Curlian photography. That's one way of doing it. This is, most people have heard of this by now. It's a method called gas discharge visualization, or GDV, by a Russian scientist, uh, Konstantin Karatkov, uh, which is basically he took Curlian photography. And in Curlian photography, you take a picture of your fingertip, and you take a picture actually of all 10 fingertips, and then he developed a mathematical algorithm to convert the 10 images on the left of individual fingers into the whole body energy field. And there's an example of someone who's ill on the left and someone who's quite well. Because uh, when your field is coherent and organized, it's full and it's healthy. The GDV machine is the old one, and now he, he has a new affordable one called the BioWell. But you can't take pictures of plants, for example, with the new BioWell like you could in the old one. Okay, so here's another, another Russian who came up with a, a way of measuring the electric fields around the body. Not the electromagnetic field, but just the electric field. And it has to do with the electrical impedance. So it's an electrical property that you can measure in an unusual way that gives you the measurement of the electrical field. And if you measure it this way, you, what you get is kind of like a, an outline of the field. You don't see a lot of detail, but you see the shape of the field, which is kind of important because it's the shape that you will find, we'll find out later, the shape of the molecules that determines how effective a molecule is at being an antenna. So in this case, it would be the shape of the whole body field, which is determining its ability to be an antenna. So you can see there are distinct differences between uh, normal and disease, and nobody knows about this method. It just, I mean, you'd be surprised what's in the Russian literature. The Russians are so far ahead of us. Um, I, I mean, Americans don't know what's going on in, in Russia, for sure. They don't even know what's going on in Europe. I mean, I have to go to conferences in Europe to find out what's going on in Europe, let alone Russia. I don't know why, but there's just literally no communication between what's going on in America. And, and I know you guys will, will all love to hear this kind of stuff. So I, there are people like Jim Oshman and myself who, who pick up all this literature and present it to you guys in a hopefully palatable way. So you can walk away going, that's cool, or whatever. <laughs> so my mission is more like to get people to you know, really understand what I'm trying to say. So, okay, so here now let's talk about cells and let's talk about energy around the cell. So we're talking about energy before we talk about coherence because you have to understand what energy is. All right, so the best way to measure energy around the cell, which is very, very rarely done in mainstream science. There are, I get the feeling there are a few scientists here, there are spectrophotometric techniques that people use, but they don't really use them with whole cells for some bizarre reason. But when it comes to light, there's a lot of experiments done by a particular a German scientist by the name of Fritz Popp, who discovered that cells give off light. But it's a special kind of light. It's very, very weak. So it's called ultra-weak photon emission. And it's very, very coherent. Aha, magic word. Uh, we're getting there. Little by little, working our way to the definition of coherence. But here is a special photomultiplier tube which measures light. It's a super duper one, so it measures really weak light. As a function of time, you could see that the light comes out as spurts. It's not like you just, like a flashlight, you just radiate light. It comes out like that. If, if there are any healers in the room, uh, you guys will know that when you, well, when you put out, but when you feel the energy of a, of a person that you're healing, their energy comes back to you as in spurts. So this is just a diagram, and it's, and it's all over the place. Sometimes it's strong, sometimes it's weak. It's, it's, it's hard to do conventional science on this because a, a typical scientist would take an average and, of the whole thing and say, oh, okay, that's what's coming out. But that's kind of useless because you need to understand the dynamic behavior of the energy to really understand what's going on. Time is on the x-axis in uh, minutes. 
And the, uh, on the y-axis is the, is the intensity of the light as measured by a photon. Uh, photon multiplier tube in, in lux is probably is a standard way of measuring light, the strength of a light. So uh, biophotonic energy. So here's a, his first article was in 1984, great year. This is by Pop, where he talks about biophoton emission, new evidence for coherence, because he's the guy that discovered all the, these different physical properties that he could measure showed him that the energy he was measuring was coherent. And I don't really have time to go into the, the photon statistics and the spectral distribution and the blah, blah, blah t scientific terminology. But the bottom line is it didn't behave like ordinary light, particularly the decay. So the simplest way to put this is decay, decay behavior after exposure to light. So you expose the sample to light, and then you measure the decay. And it doesn't behave like ordinary light. So he said, OK, there's something. It, it, it's, it, that means it's very coherent. In fact, it's so coherent, it's more coherent than any man-made laser. And lasers are really coherent. So the fact that the light in the body is that coherent, it was, it was very a shock to everybody. And his work got kind of rejected by the scientific community, pop, uh, for years. And then eventually, people kept doing it and doing it and getting the same results. And I'm going, oh my god, there's something going on here. So he's, like, he's the guy that brought the whole, he, he came up with the term biophotons. A photon is a photon is a photon, a physicist would say, but biophotons are very different than ordinary photons in this way. OK, so what about the energy around molecules? Sci traditional scientists like to study that much more because they, they like nice simple systems. And some molecules, like DNA, are pretty damn complicated, right? So they do study that. And one of the ways they study that is, in, is by mathematically modeling the energy. This is what they do in quantum chemistry. And they're able to actually show on the left, see on the left, well, there's the molecule on the right. That's, a, that's the old fashioned way of representing a molecule as a stick model, you know, bits and pieces come together. Atoms, sorry, let's be technical here, right? Uh, you've got uh, the white uh, balls are hydrogen and the black ones are carbon and the red ones are probably oxygen or whatever. Uh, but <clears throat> that molecule is represented by the white part in the white little structure on the left. So that's the actual chemical. But you can see that in quantum chemistry, they modeled the energy field around the molecule. And it's got a very different shape depending on which part of the molecule you're dealing with. And it's, they're called contour lines. Oh, this is, the molecule is actually dopamine, a neurotransmitter. One example of how they study energy around molecules. Another way, oh, we're back to the Russians again. This, this is an experiment that American scientists would never dream of doing. OK, this is so bizarre. They use a, a kind of spectrophotometer where you, to, it, actually, this was done with DNA. The guy's name is Gary Ayev. You can look him up on the, on, the, on, the, on the web. But if you put phantom DNA, it's all kinds of stuff about this on the web. So what they did was they took a spectrophotometer and they had a, a little cuvette with DNA in it. And you took, put the cuvette in the machine, you close the top, you take a picture. OK, fine. That's what a normal scientist would do. But what they did was they said, well, we're going to take the cuvette out and take another picture immediately after because we want to take a picture of the energy that's left behind by the molecule. And they did it. And so, so, so here's a picture. Uh, and it's a, it's a visual thing, which is nice, so I don't have to show you numbers. Th that's the background empty space. So there's no order. I mean, the presence of a molecule, a coherent molecule like DNA with a very organized structure, will generate a structure I instead of this amorphous blob in the background. So on the top is the physical DNA, which gives a nice orderly structure, which is what you'd expect. But on the bottom is the energy of the DNA molecule. So when they remove the molecule and pass the light through the space where it was, there's no physical molecule there. But it gives a pattern which is similar but different to the actual molecule, which says to me a lot. So this is a good example of the fact that all molecules have an energy. And this is good scientific explanation of it. So here's an experiment that I did. The particular molecule was a, a, a drug 
which is an MAO inhibitor. People probably know about MAO inhibitors. MAO is an enzyme. What I did was to see if I could, well, what I did was I passed a laser beam over the top of a molecule. So the molecule sitting there like this, and it's a powder sitting there right there, and I pass a laser beam over the top. So it's not interacting with the molecule, but it's interacting with the energy of the molecule that's right above the molecule. And what happened was that the energy of the molecule gets carried by the laser beam. So the laser beam picks it up and says, oh, this is cool. I got, so I got some MAO inhibitor in me, you know. Uh. And it, then I direct the laser to some cells down here on the bottom left. Oh, we can see that right here. This is a Petri dish with nerve cells, which have the enzyme, MAO. So it turns out the laser beam by itself had no effect on the enzyme, but when you modulate the laser beam with the information or the energy of the drug, it does affect the enzyme. But it did not inhibit the enzyme. It actually did the opposite. It stimulated the enzyme. So I, what I did was delivered the homeopathic information of the molecule to the cells, and the enzyme responded accordingly and got stimulated instead of inhibited, which goes to show you how much I am unable to influence a system like this with my beliefs and my consciousness, because I was expecting the exact opposite effect. Anyway, so this was a cool experiment, and I've never published it, but I get to share it with you guys in lectures. I did it because I met this guy, uh, guy uh, Dr. Omura, an MD, Japanese doctor in New York, who would treat people that way. He would take a drug, and he'd put the drug there, and he'd take his laser beam, and he'd point the laser beam at you. You'd get the information from the drug, not the drug, and he would heal people that way. And I thought, oh, God, that's awesome, man. Jeez, if you can really do that, I want to test it in, in vitro, in a cellular system, and see if it really works. And sure, sure enough, it worked. I mean, I, it, it, I have various reasons why it had the opposite effect that I wanted to. But if you tweak this some more and do whatever you need to do to get it to work in the, in, and actually inhibit, like the dr drug itself, this is a very valuable potential tool for treating people. But the point is, I'm just giving you an example of another example of how molecules have energy. And here's the results. So the laser had no effect. There's the control. Uh, the drug itself inhibited the effect, and the, the laser with the information stimulated the effect. So, OK, so that's the results. So, OK, now let's talk about coherence. Are we all ready to take, talk about coherence? Before we do, we have two questions. Yes, OK, three questions. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I delivered the homeopathic information because I coupled the drug to the laser in the wrong way. You, there's a million different ways you could do it. Like the obvious way to do it is to make a solution and then pass the laser through the water with the drug. That would have been a whole different way. Or make a solution and then pass the laser right next to the test tube instead of through the test. I mean, there's a million ways you could do it. So no one's ever did this before scientifically, so that's an observation. You know, then you're stuck with, and I, I do these experiments, and there are no explanations. And 20 years later, I read an article, or I hear something from somebody, ah, oh, that's finally, I got the explanation for this experiment I did 20 years ago. So anyway, uh, so we don't, th that's my explanation, in a nutshell, right? Okay, well, they only did it for one, for that one molecule, uh, and I actually, I heard like 10 years later that it wasn't so reproducible, so they didn't, um, do it a lot. They, they didn't do it. A, how long does it last? I don't know how long it lasts. Probably not very long, because the, all that coherence and all that order in the space where the molecule was, that order associated with the molecule. If the molecule it, it, and the source of that coherence is gone, then the coherence just dissipates and and you lose it, and it's called decoherence. This is a phenomenon which is now known in the physics literature. Things don't stay coherent very long because there's so much chaos in our environment that if you exist and function at a coherent level, and you, you walk outside in the streets of New York City, man, boom, you're incoherent like that. You, you could be, you know, you meditate, and, oh, I'm great, I'm coherent, I'm good, I'm healthy. You walk outside in the street, and bingo, you're incoherent. So, no, it doesn't last very long. <laughs> that's, hard to, that's hard to explain. <laughs>
<laughs> well, th th that to me suggests that the uh, photons are coming from some other source in addition to the molecule. Yeah, and holding them there. And yeah, right. Now, when we get to the water part, th then water has, has, does have the ability, and it's known to have the ability to hold and store the information. So if water can do it, maybe air can do it, or the water molecules in the air. So there's my explanation. Yeah, let alone a dog that can sniff a, the smell or the odor of a person who's a mile away. Like, we're, uh, we're, we're, what, 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 what molecule are they sniffing? You know, right? Uh, <laughs> that I don't know how to explain. They, uh, dogs are very sensitive, and all you need is one molecule. So one molecule kind of meanders its way, you know, makes it into the nose, and bingo, you can smell it. So, and and it, could, it could last, well, they're the same question, it could last long if there's a way to keep it coherent, to keep it organized, to keep it intact. I guess if there's a million molecules, one of them might just be hardy enough and strong enough and smart enough to make its way to the nose of the dog. Right, well, they, they believe that the vacuum is the source, is a, back to that same question, is another source of the photons in addition to the, the molecule, which gets really complicated. And then we, you know, we want to talk about quantum physics or, or, or you know, we're going to try to not go there because it gets really complicated and we're going to lose people. Now let's talk about coherence. So, uh, well, to coherence really, it's a property that typically is exchanged between two energy fields. So there are many different types of coherence. And the technical names will kind of blow you away. But just to know that, well, you know, you could imagine what spatial coherence is and it's, uh, coherence over time instead of space and spin coherence, so coherence associated with the spinning of a molecule rather than the oscillation of, of a molecule or a field. And, of course, electromagnetic coherence. Well, so mostly we're going to talk about electromagnetic coherence and quantum coherence. Because when we get to the rare earth elements that you put in your soils as farmers, they have quantum coherence properties. So if you have two electromagnetic fields and they have the same frequency and the same, they're generated by the same waveform, like if it was a sine wave, so they're really very, very similar. But the only thing is that their peaks and troughs are slightly shifted in time, which means they're out of phase then that is the definition of coherence. They're in, they're in coherence by virtue of their phase information. But remember, it could be the spin information or it could be the oscillation. It could, it could be lots of different things. But that's the classic definition, which has to do with the, the oscillation versus the power of the oscillation, which gets pretty technical. To simplify this, it, you could see all the definitions of the different kinds of coherence it's a correlation between two waves or two properties of the wave or between one wave inside another wave, which will come up later. So it doesn't have to be two, the two waves don't have to be separated in distance. They can be like superimposed, if you will, on each other or one within the other. And you can have correlations between different properties, whether it's the state of the molecule, the, the, the frequency of the molecule, the uh, phase of the molecule, uh, you know, etc. And that's the technical definition of coherence. But the other point to mention on this slide is that quantum coherence, then they don't use the word uh, correlation, they use the word superposition. In other words, instead of having two different properties like the phase two different waveforms, like, oh, they correlate. So when this changes, that changes, and okay, they're, they're, they're coherently connected. In a, if it was a, in the quantum world, the two properties are superimposed on each other. So they are not only talking to each other, but they like become one. A simple way to put it, I guess. <laughs> and, and now we're talking about quantum states, not vibratory states or phase states. And that we were talking about before, about the quantum properties of, of a biological material or a rare earth element. OK, that's kind of technical. Uh, so coherence is a term that is used in all of these different scientific disciplines. But you guys are the first people to talk about it in nutrition. If you look in the scientific literature, coherence and, and nutrition or, or plants or food or diet, it just, it, nobody's talking about it. So 
you should be honored that you guys are really the first to introduce this, these concepts into your field. Okay, so, so what are the applications of coherence, aside from in the health industry and, and eating healthy food and eating coherent food? Well, they use, they use them in holography and astronomy with, with the um, telescopes, radio telescopes, with lasers, water research, super fluidity and superconductivity are quantum properties, not ordinary properties. But the one thing that's worth mentioning is optical coherence tomography, which is a kind of method of measuring what you were asking before. How do you measure these things? Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about that because that's relevant for soil. Okay, so let's talk about coherence in the human body. Well, as I said in the introduction, I used to work at the Institute of Heart Math, and they were very fascinated with um, intention. And intention induces coherence in the heart, and the relevance of that is, of course, is when you're growing plants and you're in a positive, emotional, loving, caring state, you pass on that coherence to your plants. And then you, then you eat it, and you pass on that coherence back to your body or whoever eats it. So th th these concepts about I'm going to talk about now are kind of highly relevant because a lot of it has to do with intention. But we talked about, before we talk about intention, let's talk about the electrical way of measuring the heart. So that's a standard electrocardiogram, which measures the electrical properties of the heart. And it, on the y-axis here, the vertical axis, is the heart rate. Now, the heart rate varies all the time. The heart rate is never 70 beats per minute or 72 beats. I mean, that's the average. And over time, on the, on, in this case, seconds on the, on the x-axis here, we have the fluctuations in the heart rate. And when you're in a positive emotional state, the, co the fluctuations are very coherent, and they look like at the bottom. And when you're in, a, in a, a, a negative emotional state or stressed out, your fluctuations look like at the top. Okay, so that was, a, that was one of the first things they discovered, which had never been done before. In fact, I, when one of the reasons I left Stanford, as I said, because I, I looked in the scientific literature about the effects of positive emotions on the human body, and there were precious few. There was like one guy who was showing people movies of... Mother Teresa, and measuring various things about, you know, you're so, so inspired when you, you, you see her work, you know, and kind of your heart goes, oh, oh you know, and, and they were measuring that, uh, and I thought, well, that's cool, but that was like the only thing I could find in the scientific literature, so, so this is great, this is the kind of stuff I do, what no man has done before, you know, uh, let's study the beneficial effects of positive emotions, that's, so that was, this is what kind of, I found this out, I thought, well, no, this is really cool, all right, so, uh, so, Turns out that coherence in the heart uh, is measured with ECG, uh, da, 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 anger, frustration, positive emotions are beneficial to the body, and negative emotions are harmful. Well, as I said, the, the scientific literature was full of negative emotions and stress uh, are da damaging to your body, and there was a lot of literature on that, but not on the positive effects. The whole field in those days was called psychoneuroimmunology, mind over the immune system, mind over body medicine, mind-body medicine, it was called, you know. And the basic research at the time was to, to study the relationship between what was going on in the brain and what was going on in the heart, because these are two strong electrical systems. The heart is much stronger than the brain, by the way. The heart, you can measure on your toe the electrical fields generated from the heart are so strong they propagate through the whole body, whereas the brain is kind of like, you know, it's only up here, you can't measure the brain and your toe. Maybe that's a good thing. Anyway, at heart math, what they were very interested in is the relationship between the two. So they studied them both simultaneously uh, in these different emotional states and discovered that the heart changed first, and then the brain waves changed in accordance with the heart. So the heart was really talking to the brain whereas the dogma is the other way around. So then we did uh, these experiments with DNA to see if they could influence DNA in a test tube placed in front of them. The bottom line was that, uh, this, this is my theory about how it all works, but the bottom line was that their intention to change DNA only worked when they were generating this kind of coherence in their heart. 
So that's an important conclusion for, for all of the work with intentionality. The energy from the heart is coherent, and it's believed to be in the shape of a toroid. So here's the experiment that we did with, with the DNA. DNA exists as two strands. With heat, you can partially unwind the two strands, as in the demo, uh, uh, picture here. And then what you do is you measure, what I did, was measured the rate that the DNA forms back to, into an intact helix. So normally it's, it's, it's a helix. You unwind the two strands a little bit, and then you just let it sit there, and it goes, zoop, and it goes right back to its natural intact state. Imagine that. It has intelligence. It knows, oh, I'm not supposed to be half unwound. I'm supposed to be intact. And you can measure that process and the time it takes to do that with a spectrophotometer because uh, light, uh, the, the thing absorbs the DNA molecules, some of these things inside absorb at a particular wavelength, and you can measure that. And this is what you measure. Over time, you measure the absorption of light, which decreases over time because the guy that's inside is absorbing the light. The more it's intact, the less it absorbs light. If it's open, then it could, it could, the light gets to it. Okay, so this is what you measure, and then the, you get the computer to give this black line, and then you get a slope. So we're measuring the slope, which is the rate of rewinding. So what we did, a lot of work with healers. So I want to ask everyone their opinion. How many people think that a healer would speed up this process? Well, think about it. You know, it's coming back to its natural state. Okay, how many people think it would be slowed down, if anybody? Right. Well, I was in the former group myself. It turns out that healers slow down this process, which kind of one of those phenomena I was talking about before. Why the hell would that happen? It's supposed to speed it up. It's making it bring it back to its normal state. And I struggled with that for years and never published this because I had no explanation. But then eventually I realized that it, it, by slowing down the process, you increase the fidelity. It's got to be pretty accurate. You know, if you screw up the, the recombination and, they, and it doesn't come right back the way it's supposed to be, then you, you have a defective DNA. So to ensure that it was accurate, they slowed the system down. All right, anyway, the point is, oh, wait, so here it is, slowing down, the rewinding, there's the control. And now here you can see on the far right, the healers, and then these two technologies in the middle are our machine, one of which is a paramagnetic material and the other which is a, another a, a plasma, a device that generates plasma energy. And when I did these experiments, they all slowed down the DNA. So I thought, oh, okay, well, I mean, that's why it really needs to slow down. But the other conclusion for me about this slide, the most important conclusion, is that, thank God, humans are better than machines at doing this sort of thing. I mean, I, I'm standing there going, oh, God. It better be better come out this way because because it, then otherwise how would a machine work better than a human? So healers are are and the good healers are, are amazing. I mean some people can really resonate with DNA and and really affect the DNA. I studied uh, a lot of Reiki practitioners, and uh, but I studied many different disciplines, and it was this one or two particular Reiki practitioners who just had the ability to resonate with DNA. No correlation with the amount of years they were practiced. No correlation with, you know, how powerful a healer they were, or, or anything obvious about them. You you couldn't say, well, oh, the, this person really could talk to DNA. All the healing modalities caused the DNA to slow down. And then I kept looking for more. You know, I had DNA parties in my house, invite invite people over. See if you can change the DNA, you know. <laughs> and I bring the equipment all out and say, okay, here, here treat it. And, then, and I go back into the room and come back with the results. Hey, you slowed it down. Next. You know, and everybody slows it down to varying degrees. And I finally met these people called the Reconnection Healers. If anybody's heard of the Reconnection Healers, they're from California. Oh, this is, we're on the East Coast. No, actually, they're all over the world. But they claim that they're bringing in all these new energies onto the planet. And I thought, oh, well, that's cool. And sure enough, they speed, I tested three of their practitioners, and they all speeded up the DNA, rewinding. So I was going like, oh, well, they really are bringing it because I have new energies here. They're having the opposite effect of, uh, of everybody else. And what's important is that that means that there are two different kinds of healers, if you will, stimulatory and inhibitory healers. 
healers that speed things up in your body and, and healers that slow things down. Well, how do you know if you've got a problem, what kind of healer to go to? Or for that matter, maybe you need both. And in what order? Oh, first I've got to speed things up and then slow them down? No, no, I've got to slow them down first, then speed them up. I mean, nobody knows this because no one has ever discovered this before. So it kind of opened up Pandora's box in terms of the whole healing profession because uh, now nobody knows what kind of healer to go to. Uh, so, sorry. <laughs> okay, so here's some actual numbers. When we're talking about entrainment, we're talking about the ability to go into that coherent mode uh, with the brain waves being coherent. So both groups, well, so, so if you compare, and then it's comparing intention with no intention. So if you compare the control group with the first category, that they're entrained, but they have no intention to affect the DNA. They're just putting out hard energy, coherent hard energy. Well, so they didn't really have an effect on the DNA until they added the intention. So you need both the intention and the coherence. So when you're trying to influence your plants and make them grow bigger and better and happier and more coherently, you have to do both. You have to generate the coherence in yourself. And the best way to do that is to meditate and have the intention. So now let's move on to coherence in water. Now we're back to Dan's original model where he kept saying, well, it's the structure of the molecules in the body which become more coherent. Well, what does that mean? Uh, well, here's an example of coherent structures in, in water. They're called, uh, struc it's called structured water because the molecules are not randomly distributed. They're organized. They're in a very orderly fashion. The slide in the middle is uh, the work of Emoto. Uh, everyone heard of Emoto in this group? Surely, he's, like, everyone knows about Emotos, right? Yeah, right, right. Unfortunately, he would take a pic he would send love to water and he'd take a hundred different pictures and he'd pick and choose the ones that he wanted. And they were all different. <laughs> because again, this phenomena, when you're dealing with these kind of energies, it, it's not like it's like, like dealing with a chemical. You had a chemical, you get the same effect every time. With energy, it's not so reproducible. So we don't really know that what he did was scientific, but nonetheless, if he if water crystallizes, in, however and however often it does, and uh, whatever circumstances it does create an image like that, that's a lot of order in, in the water. That's a lot of organization. That's a lot of coherence. And, and the examples on the right are, are water clusters around minerals. Top, it would be a positively charged mineral in the center. And in the bottom, it would be a negatively charged mineral because, remember, water has two negative charges and one positive charge, H2O. So it, it can or, order itself around a positive or negative charge in, in, a, in a slightly different modality. But the point is that these structures are very organized and very coherent. So here's a good example of coherence in the body, which is you don't need any science, just pictures. So here's, okay, so here's, um, again, a, a Emoto. Now, on the right, I, wanted, I was telling you about this lady who talks to water. So she does crystallization patterns. So we're talking here about freezing water, and that's how Emoto did his experiments, by the way. You put them in a freezer, and then it, it crystallizes. So you get these crystallization patterns in the water. Now, and so Emoto would send emotion, you know, positive and negative emotions to the water. Well, what this person did was play the song, fly like an eagle to a glass of water. The, song, the water listens to the song and then freezes. And this is a pattern. Can you see the eagle there? It's, it's got a little out of focus, but at the top is an eagle. And uh, there are all kinds of pictures like this. I don't want to belabor the point, but the water clearly has an intelligence. I mean, the other thing, she, she asked the water, she said, do you know me? She crystallizes the water, and her initials show up. In, 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 you know, I mean, very clear, two letters of her initials. And going like, oh, okay, now that's weird. And, I, and I've seen a lot of weird stuff before, so you know, I was kind of blown away by that. And I just found that out two weeks ago in, in Germany at the water conference. But anyway, really cool stuff. And it, again, it shows you that intention can organize the water in a very specific way. That's the main point. 
we're talking about organization and order. Okay, everyone knows about cymatics, probably. It's when you uh, play sound to water and you vibrate a plate with the vibrations at that particular frequency, in this case 432 hertz, which is considered the frequency of love, uh, although there's no science behind that statement. These are the kind of organized patterns you get in cymatics. So here's another, yet another completely different way to show and demonstrate the patterns and the organization of water. Okay, so then we have the physics. There's a theoretical quantum physicist by the name of Emilio del Giudice, an Italian scientist who was obsessed with water and information storage in water. And he discovered that bulk water is not homogeneous. Like we think water is water, and we have these water molecules distributed ar uh, around the water, bulk water. Well, actually, they form very specific, discrete regions, which he called a coherence domains, uh, because inside the water, the water was very highly organized, a bit like the patterns that we've been seeing. So, and it's a bit like ice. It's, so it's kind of like ice particles in distributed in water, but it's not really ice. So he calls them quantum or coherent domains. And he's, these are several of the articles that, that he wrote about coherent dynamics in water, coherent structures in water. Well, that's the term Dan uses, coherent structures, that, that way back in the model in the beginning. That's what is induced when you eat healthy food and bring in the consciousness and when you meditate. So it's those coherent structures which then generate coherent energy to produce all these beneficial effects. Uh, and again, another article, Coherent Structures. And the fourth article is about QED, which is quantum electrodynamics, which is the use of quantum field theory to explain what's going on at the quantum level. But this is, a, this is a really a macroscopic phenomena, because this phenomena explains homeopathy, explains information storage in water, and it explains explains that, that picture on the right and that picture on the left, for that matter. So uh, this guy actually published all of these articles and uh, revolutionized the whole field of water science, which recently has, has taken off to a new level because there was a major conference at the Royal Society of Medicine in London talking about this kind of stuff, which was awesome because it's considered fringe science because it's, I mean, this guy's a theoretical physicist, you know, but he got away with it because he had all the equations. Unless you put equations, nobody believes you. Hmm. I, that's a problem I have. I'm a biologist, remember. Okay, so anyway, so uh, let's talk about, moving on from water molecule, let's talk about other molecules uh, in the body. So coherence, uh, again, is the relationship, now we're talking about be the correlation between two molecules instead of between two states of being or spin state, relaxed state, whatever. In other words, when the two states or the, the two vi uh, uh, vibrations are in phase, then you ha generate the coherence. And, wh and what can be in phase? The, the, mo the, the molecules themselves, the vibrations of the molecules, their electromagnetic fields, the distribution of charge. I mean, all, all these different things can be in phase or out of phase with each other. So that, again, is a little slightly different perspective from a molecular point of view about coherence. OK, great. So back to the question earlier. How do you measure this kind of stuff? Well, these are five or six different techniques which have been measured. They're very sophisticated techniques. They're complicated. Uh, you see the one in the middle is called quantum coherence, optical spectroscopy. I'm going to talk a little bit about optical spectroscopy and multidimensional spectroscopy, which is not what it sounds like. Anyway, there are scientific methods of doing this at the molecular level, and these are examples of molecules that have really cool and interesting properties. We've heard about water starting at the bottom, and we've heard about DNA starting at the top. But, oh, we've even talked about microtubules. DNA is a double helix. Collagen is a triple helix. So again, we're talking about molecules that could act as antenna. 
because they're literally you know, waving around and, and able to pick up energies. And porphyrins, uh, that's another whole lecture uh, in itself. That's the complex structure, very, very organized structure in glycoproteins that are present on the surface of the cell membrane, acting as antenna, Bruce, a la Bruce Lipton, you know, oh, picking up all that information in, in the environment. So there are some really interesting molecules in the body uh, to pay attention to. Okay, so let's talk about multidimensional coherence spectroscopy. I just wanted to show this because it's really cool and it's complicated, but I'll simplify it. So in ordinary spectroscopy, you have one laser beam, which you shine on the sample in that, in the, in that little uh, cage up there, and you excite it. And what happens is, you can see this little diagram here, the, the electrons jump up to a, an excited state and then come back down again and emit energy. So that's the phenomena that we're talking about. And you can measure that. But in this kind of spectroscopy, you don't have one excitation light. You have multiple, that's when they say multiple dimensions, they mean multiple signals to stimulate. And they're all spaced differently. They're coming in at different angles. The, the, the pulses, shapes are different. They're all, they're all different. What changes? The frequency, the harmonics, the phase relationship, and the, even the geometry are, are all variables that affect the outcome of this little wave here that, that, comes, off of the, that comes off of the molecule. This molecular signal on the far right is different than any of the input signals. So uh, we have a really unique response to this complex stimuli. And they use this to give you inf get information about the mo molecule. Light or whatever, the signal that comes off the molecules, gives them information about how coherent the molecule is in the first place. OK, so the, mo the molecular signal that comes off the molecule is a quantum field. It's not even an ordinary electromagnetic field. In this case, uh, we talked about that earlier. The, the coherence is generated from superposition of different states. And the point is that the quantum field that comes off the molecule contains all the information about the molecule. That's why they use this. And it's a very sophisticated technique, but it gives a lot of information about the molecule, in particular, its degree of coherence. All right, got that. Okay. That's all I wanted to say about molecules. Now let's move on to soil. So what in the soil could be contributing to coherence in the body? Not that we eat the soil, but, but like the microorganisms, right? I mean, any biological entity in the soil can generate coherence. If the, if the heart can generate coherence, we saw that, but actually lots of organs and molecules in the body, that's what we've been talking about, can generate coherence. So if you've got a biological system in the soil, Oh, OK, great. We're going to generate coherence into the food that we eat. But it turns out that, well, there's water in the soil. And we just learned all about the coherence in water. So that will contribute to the coherence in the food. And then we've got rare earth elements, which you guys all know uh, exist, but probably don't know a lot about rare earth elements. And I don't know that anybody in this organization has really talked much about rare earth elements. Rare earth, so let's talk about rare earth elements. Well, it turns out they're not so rare after all. They're not so rare. In fact, the abundance in the earth's crust, which is what scientists, geologists used to determine how rare they are, uh, some of them are even more abundant than copper and zinc. So that, they're not so rare after all. But some of them are quite rare, that's true. Some of them are even radioactive, but we're not talking about those. So where are they found? They're found in rocks, they're found in clay, soil, and water, all of which are right in there in, 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 where we're growing our plants. So, OK, so these guys are, they typically don't exist. Like lanthanum is probably the one you've heard of the most because it's it, they a lot of research on lanthanum. It doesn't exist by itself as an ion, as a positively charged cation. It, it combines with the sulfates and the phosphates and the negatively charged molecules in the soil. And it forms complex, it, uh, organic, it combines with organic compounds, combines with microorganisms that tend to 
sit right on top of it. They, they, they have this kind of symbiotic relationship, all the microorganisms uh, sitting there right on top of the rare earth elements. In the plant, it actually, get, of course, they get into the plant, and they, they activate chlorophyll in the plant itself, right in the roots. They're associated with fulvic acid, amino acids, and silica. The silica is particularly interesting because it has all kinds of really cool properties of its own. And when you've got a combination of rare earth elements and silica, you've got one big coherent dynamo, <laughs> so to speak. So that I find interesting. So that's the rare earth elements. Now, actually, there are, they're called vanthanides as an umbrella term, of which there are 15 different kinds. And I didn't bore you with a list of all 15. But the common ones are lanthanum, cerium, neodymium. And what's interesting is that they vary enormously from location to location, from chemical to chemical. It could be 130-fold differences in, in the concentration of these different things. Uh, they're all over the place. Uh, and then by the time they get into the plant, and depending on the plant, uh, they can vary 10,000-fold, not on the amounts that are in at the location and the type of plant all make a difference to what you end up with uh, in terms of which ones. So it's very variable. What else can we say? We can say they're found in nature. I said they combine with phosphates, sulfates, borates, carbonates. Um, um, there's a, in soil science, which you guys probably know better than me, there's a lot about how these rare earth elements stay in the soil and, and, and how and why they're released into the, into the plant or into the environment. And it depends on the moisture, the mineral content, the weathering. I mean, there's a lot of complicated geology stuff that I don't know much about because I'm not a geologist. When it comes to the plant itself, they end up in the plant and they end up in the plaque or the xylem or the vacuoles. Uh, the roots more so than the leaves, than the stem, than the grain. And that what's interesting here is that commercially grown uh, vegetables are depleted in these things. Now, everyone used to think that they were bad or harmful, but you guys know better because I think you guys actually add rare earth elements. And too much is not good, but a little bit is actually very beneficial, which you'll see in the next slide. I don't, I don't know if anyone's ever compared organic or your grown by, by the methods that you guys use versus conventional methods to see whether the rare earth elements are really are much stronger or which ones are there or which ones prefer, but I would predict that they would be higher and uh, more coherent. Root tips, the most efficient way to get into the plant is through the roots. Okay, so here's, we're talking right about the way it gets into the plant. Mostly they're added to fertilizers I said high doses are harmful, low doses are beneficial. Commonly used in Chinese agriculture uh, as a source of nutrition. I guess Mer uh, they don't do that in, in American Europe because you guys are exceptional. Which I'm, why I'm talking about these things because I didn't even know they were used in agriculture at all. But there are lots of different studies, uh, mostly in Chinese because Chinese see the benefits of rare earth elements. They, they increase the growth, the biomass, uh, the root elongation, and the dry weight. These are all parameters which increase anywhere from 20% to 100%. And those variations depend on how they're delivered, when they're delivered, and how often they're delivered, the crop that you're growing, and all the other nutrients that are present in the soil. So uh, even, even the amount that's taken up into the plant varies all over the place. And even the results that they get, uh, oh, here, biomass growth, these beneficial effects, uh, not everybody gets them. It depends on, on, on all these factors in the bottom as well. Uh, and that's probably why people don't believe in them, because it's not like it's like, oh, you know, they're good for you, they're good for you or could say corn. Yeah, if you put it in, your, in the soil and you're growing corn, that's great. It depends on so many factors to actually get them to have a beneficial effect. And I guess people don't really understand exactly, maybe, I mean, Dan has a way of figuring it all out, right? That seems to work, and this is an integral part of his technique. 
OK, so uh, blah, blah, blah. beneficial effects in addition to effects on uh, chlorophyll, photosynthesis itself, and all these different enzymes. And now let's talk about coherence in rare earth elements. There are several different scientific studies that show that when they combine with these other elements, they form these same kind of cubic and orthorhombic and tetraagonal structures that we saw in the water. These are highly organized structures. They're very coherent. And in fact, here's a quote from a book called Rare Earth Elements in Ge Geochemistry. The coherence in the rare earth elements comes from their geochemical behavior. So, that, uh, so they're acknowledging that. And they, 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 they form crystalline uh, substances, which uh, exhibit very unusual light scattering properties, blah, 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 blah. They have quantum properties, which I guess I don't really have time, but they, because the quantum stuff gets really complicated. And after an hour and a half listening to me, not a good time to go into the details of the quantum uh, properties of earth, rare earth elements, but they do have them. And then I wanted to talk about plants. OK, we talked about Carolinian photography before, remember? Uh, we're now hit, so before we talk about coherence in plants, we're going to talk about the energy in plants. Well, this is one way to measure the energy in plants. On the left is a Carolinian photograph of a leaf. You take an intact leaf, you put it on the thingy thingy, and you get uh, this, these emissions, energetic aura type me, uh, emissions coming from the plant. So you go, OK, well, that's not surprising. But what's surprising is the one on the right. And the one on the right, they cut off the top bit. And they put the bottom three quarters of the plant on, on the thing. And they took a picture. Even though there's no physical leaf at the tip, you still see the energy. It's a bit like the DNA phantom experiments. The molecule's gone, but the energy stays behind. And, the, and, and this effect does not last very long, but it's measurable. It's, because we're dealing with energy, it's not so reproducible, but it does, if, all that has to happen is once. And then you go, oh my god, you know, we're taking a picture of the energy where the plant was. So that just proves to me, anyway, that uh, there's a lot of energy in plants. Uh, here's a, a curling photograph of a raw broccoli on the right, and a cook, you cook it, you, you destroy the energy. We all know that, but here's an actual picture of that, right, in case your left brain doesn't believe people. When I eat, should, you should eat raw vegetables. Right, right, right. Anyway, so okay. So then now, if you type the word coherence in, in the scientific literature, this is the last part. Coherence in plants. That's what this is all about. The whole model is based on coherence in plants and generating coherence in the human body. Well, how does that happen? Or does it happen? What, what, what's the evidence? Sorry. What's the evidence that there's any coherence in plants? So if you do a search in the scientific literature, coherent and plant, what comes up is this, optical coherence tomography, which is a method of measuring coherence that involves coherent excitation, like the, the diagram I showed you with the multidimensional spectroscopy. This is very similar, but different. Uh, it uses laser beams. You excite the, the molecule or, or the plant, and then you measure the energy that's emitted. It's a very specific kind of thing, but it shows you that there is coherence in plants. And here's some actual pictures uh, that uh, this is a kiwi uh, fruit measure showing the, uh, the, the vacuoles. Here's a picture uh, on, uh, between a normal seed and, and a virally infected seed. You can see there's two bands at, on the bottom that you don't see uh, in the control. And here's a picture. Uh, of a diseased leaf. On the bottom slide, you see the big defect, and, and it should be like a smooth thing all the way through. So they, they're using this kind of stuff to, to measure diseases in, in plants, but I'm saying that this is also proof and evidence that plants are coherent in nature, or you wouldn't be generating these pictures at all. So that's the bottom line. This, this is the conclusion is the same as the introductory slide, that there are coherence in all of these different systems that we went through one by one. Thank you for hanging in there. And here's the model again. So again, it's the coherent structure in the body, which is activated by the food and all of the, the mechanisms that I described, which generates coherent energy in the body, which promotes health and helps raise consciousness. The raising of the consciousness part 
is almost like another whole lecture, but bottom line is that is the model. And there's my contact information. Anybody wants to communicate? Thank you so much for your attention. Okay. Now, anybody wants to stay, I'm here. You can stay and ask questions now or until we get kicked out. No, there's no machine, but people can apparently detect that. Uh, the, 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 remember the, uh, the lady from New Zealand who showed you the fly like an eagle picture? Well, they did a picture, she did a picture of a, of a stream that had this very famous mill uh, on the prop, right by, the, the stream went right by the, the mill. And you take a picture of the stream, uh, you take some of the water and you take, freeze it, and sure enough, you see a, a building in the, in the picture. You go like, oh my God, there, there, there's the building, that's the building. But that building had not been adjacent to the stream for like 100 years. And, and, the, and the information is still in the water. So yeah, the information uh, that you're describing can still be around, apparently, unlike the question we were discussing before, that it doesn't last long. But uh, it was, it, it, people can pick it up, and water can pick it Look, if water can pick it up, surely the consciousness of a, of a psychic or whatever could pick it up. Yeah, well, maybe next year I'll talk about radionics. Well, uh, there are uh, devices in Europe, like uh, Biocom and things like that, that can measure energies. And in most of these devices, you have to put your hand on a, on a sensor. But you could put a leaf on it, just like the curling in photography. Is that that's all done with a leaf. So you could put a leaf on there and get a measurement. Yeah, I, that's a whole body of literature I, I haven't even researched, but we could all do that, prepare for next year.